This episode brought to you by Love Books. Ideal for that special someone that really deserves a meaningful gift. the nostalgia critic guy remember it so you don't have to say it's december <laughs> well i suppose i should change into my christmas clothes <laughs> not that christmas is a big deal around here <laughs> for Christmas. Um, critic? I know. It's intentional. I wanted to see if a more breezy Christmas was what I was looking for as some girls choose to fight crime in this. Naturally. Naturally. But I feel I don't have the, um, calves for this, so I will alter this outfit. It was a good try. Yeah, you get it. You get it. Critic? It's fine, it's fine. I want this. I, I totally want this. Even though you just said it didn't work. I said that because I needed more leg to balance out the size of the calves. Mm, balance out. Yes, it's freeing. It's very freeing. It doesn't look freeing. I feel alive. Very alive. You look dead. Very dead. Leave. Both inside and outside dead. Leave. We're gonna go get some boots Leave. to balance out this Leave. whole situation. Leave. I'd get you some meatballs Leave. for your hair, but then you Leave. just look silly. Leave. Somehow this connects to the Grinch. <laughs> Because people couldn't get enough of nightmare fuel faces, awkward motorboating, and dogs asses being kissed. No, no, no. This family classic, obviously! Universal decided to give us another cinematic version of The Grinch, this time with the help of Illumination Entertainment. I mean, after they handled perfectly the haunting nature of the timeless Lorax. I'm gonna chop one down and make my the knee. Oh, there he goes rolling again. They gave another try with this cinematic circumcision. I'm not sure why people insist on breaking what's not broken, as the original animated Grinch is still the best representation of the classic story. I mean, I know why they did it, but I don't get why they don't try to understand what made the original a masterpiece before jumping wallet first into a pool of cliched stained who cash. Brought to us by the writers of, ooh, Snow Dogs and Bushwhacked? Throw in Beverly Hills Chihuahua and we'll have the Holy Trinity! The film brought in over 500 million worldwide against a 75 million budget, despite it getting less than stellar reactions from critics and audiences. So I guess the question is, what got better and what got worse since the last theatrical outing? And is there anything better in it than the original- That's <laughs> adorable you think that question is even worth finishing. So let's take a gander at how this animated green shit smells different than the live action green shit. This is- Oh, hey, we found this red bow we thought you could put in the back to really complete the look. I hate everything you right now. It'd be like you're a present to open up. There isn't a name yet for the hell I have planned for you, but rest assured you will be screaming in it. Okay, well, let us know if you need any other accessories. I won't! You look great, sweetie. Some leggings would be nice! The film opens with a narration from Pharaoh Williams. Only it's not a dream, or a hoax, or a ruse as it just made too much sense. As the film looks pretty enough, I suppose, but sadly this movie falls into an unfortunate category that a lot of animated movies are falling under. And that's being like every animated movie that's out. 
You notice they're all kind of opening the same. We see a colorful town, it's always super busy, and usually filmed in long shots. There's some zany slapstick that folks are just used to in this environment. And some outsider, either the hero or villain, is introduced. Now here's the thing, it's a good opening. The first got a bajillion times has been done, but after that, you gotta add something new. The idea of these intros is to let you marvel at a world you've never seen, show how it works, and how slash why a character doesn't fit into it. But because it's been done so much, the marveling element is less impressive. And a world like this that maybe 10 years ago would have been cool is just another kid's movie fantasy land. Unless something really charming or funny is happening, we're just not gonna be sucked in anymore. And do you think these lines are funny or charming? Smells like Christmas. Have a great day, dear. You too, honey. Whoa, where are you going? Here you go, kid. Have a wreath. Oh, cool. It's not even jokes or character building. It's just stuff being said. It's the equivalent of being like, Wow, what a brown door. That is a brown door. Has that whimsical music scored anything as charming as that brown door? <laughs> I think not brown door. Brown door. Brown door. Brown door. Brown door. That is such a brown door. Here's to no conflict ever entering our lives. Brown door. Brown door. Brown door. I'm enchanted. Brown door. We're introduced to the Grinch, played by Benedict Cumberbatch. Cool Sherlock Smog British accent or weird Chris O'Dowd House American accent? Where's my personal reserve of moose juice? And goose juice? My emergency stash of who hash? House it is. <laughs> As he wakes up to Christmas music, which not only has me asking why he'd set it to that in the morning, but what the hell do the Jackson 5 look like in this world? I mean, we know Michael grows up into a who, but still. Yo, mean one. You really are a heel. Did you really think there wouldn't be a Grinch rap in this? My favorite is it sounds like the rapper was shoved in at the last minute as a replacement for Snoop Dogg leaving to do Adam's Family. So it all sounds like a first take. Whew. Okay, I uh, got two minutes. What you got here? Uh, you're a mean one. You really are a heel. Okay, what's next? You're as cuddly as a cactus. You're as charming as an eel. Okay, we good? This mean fellow with his skin all green and his teeth far yellow. His teeth are perfect. White strips might take him up as a model. You got termites in your smile. Liars! I'm disturbed not only to see him in his underwear, I weirdly don't want to think what his dick looks like, but find he has skin suit pants to wear as well. As if he buffalo billed Broby from Yo Gabba Gabba. These are all questions no one should ask! What is this depressing bean? No, 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 no. That's impossible. You can't be out of food. <sighs> so here's the thing. Benedict Cumberbatch playing this Grinch would have been fantastic. Both him and Karloff had these elegant British accents with soft but cryptic voices. It would have matched perfect. But he's not playing that beloved creation. He's playing this tool. Super hyper, super silly with a nasally whiny American accent. This is one of your kidding things. Finally, something you said is actually funny. It's not even consistent. One minute, he sounds like Dr. Venture. What is wrong with you? Didn't you see me? I mean, if that, if that was a sled, I'd, I'd, well, I'd be dead. Come on, really? I don't know what the hell you're singing about. The next, he sounds like Agador Spartacus. Oh, you're a scream. Have a nice life. Goodbye. My father was the shaman of his tribe, okay? And sometimes, he even sounds like Jim Carrey's Grinch. <laughs> Christmas! Ah! Christmas season is no back! It's like every day he came in to record, he forgot what voice he did the previous session. But don't worry, the one consistent thing about this movie is how inconsistent it is. Yes, the Grinch hated Christmas the whole Christmas season. Now, please don't ask why. No one quite knows the reason. Yeah, these movies always use that line moments before they go into great detail the exact reason he hates Christmas. Liars! Hmm, this is a 2018 family film. That means the mother is either a strong working single parent or dead. I can't today. I have a list of errands a mile long. I'll talk to you later. I, I have to get breakfast on the table. They still got you on the night shift, huh? Sure do. You'll see me in an upcoming Hallmark movie. Which one? All of them. Sounds right. Again, like in the Carrie film, the Grinch goes in the town, which I never got. Isn't the idea he wants to stay far away from the Who's? I can see him ordering groceries from the store and leaving no tip for the delivery boy before pulling Nickelodeon pranks like this. The idea was he's a stubborn old recluse, thus it's the years of joyful noise in contrast to his personality that pushes him to finally act. And it makes sense, we've all known someone like this, especially around the holidays. This Grinch throws himself into the Who's and attention-grabbing mayhem. Uh, and Merry Christmas! Uh, 
Are you getting that? Mm, no. Ha. I could see this idiot pulling a YouTube drive through prank, filming it on his phone. Welcome to Burger Burger. How can I help you? Recording. Okay. <clears throat> yes. Uh, do you have Prince Albert in a can? Well, I hope not. We'd have to let him out. Uh, shit. Uh, hold on. Uh, uh, oh, is your refrigerator running? Somebody will catch it. God damn it. Um, uh, do you have Prince Al- I did that one. Wait, wait. Uh, uh, let me get my guitar. All right! I'll just do a Mondo burger. Great. Will that be cash, credit, or matter with my dick? What's a matter with my dick? Oh, you little bitch! Joke's on you. I'm not posting this on my channel anymore. Oh, who am I kidding? I need the views. Go to youtube.com slash Grinch Pranks. Please subscribe. Also, I seem to remember the Who celebrating Christmas on their own, not forcing their religion on others like a Pure Flix movie. Black Christmas is officially the second scariest holiday movie ever made. Meanwhile, overworked McPerfect has a daughter named Cindy Lou Who. Roger that, Mom! They really should have called her Tomboy No Joy, as again, this is their attempt to update what didn't need to be updated. Cindy Lou is supposed to be the child innocence to set off the Grinch's old corrupt soul. Though she's as interesting as tap water in the first film, they did at least get the general idea of what her role was. But here she's replaced by... Here goes Cindy Lou Who as she dashes through the snow! Girl power, I guess? She's just every generic energized kid who gets in trouble but means well in her heart. Again, this can be done well like Gosselin, Lilo, or Mabel. But where they had funny lines and unique interactions, she has SHORTCUT and BON APPETIT and OH NO! Any lines any kid in any movie would say, instantly forgettable. The original didn't need much because it was short and simple. People still remember Cindy Lou from that because of the way she was drawn and how charming she was. And yeah, she said very little, but what she needed to do was effective. But when you're doing a film that's supposed to have, I guess, complicated characters, you can't make them this Anakin. Yippee! <sighs> I haven't been this angry since Dante Bosco didn't put me in his autobiography. Oh, you did the family guy thing to promote the book. Thanks so much. Yeah, yeah, links down below. She wants to deliver a letter to Santa with a Christmas wish, but she loses it bumping into the Grinch. This isn't just a letter, this is THE letter. And what I'm wishing for is really, really important. That's why I did a bunch of crazy stunts increasing my chances of losing it! Just get the basics down! Look at this, she finds the letter and she's so bland they don't even know what reaction to give her. Emotion leaping off the screen! That's a deep, complicated face that says, I exist, I guess. Even Kenan Thompson, one of the funniest cast members on SNL right now, literally everything he says can get a laugh. 2018 Grinch shit can fix that. We all gotta keep the gray away. I myself use chocolate explosion. Yeah, that's what my wife calls me. Or at least it. I'm just trying to make it a little funny. The mayor wants Christmas to be three times bigger this year. Again, part of the charm of the Who's in the original is that they were celebrating for themselves. Nothing was forced. While the live action one was at least making commentary on it being over commercialized. While over commercializing. Here, they go over the top for no reason, making them pretty annoying to put up with. It's the most beautiful Christmas tree you've ever seen. We had to kill 20 Loraxes for this baby. Somebody's getting a nice orange fur coat. So the Grinch decides he wants to stop the lighting of the tree in Whoville. So he conjures up the clever plan of sneaking into town, attending the ceremony, pushing the ice princess off a tall building, landing on a button, igniting an army of bats to an unsuspecting public. Yo, lousy minx, you sent out all the signals! Or he tries throwing a snowball. Less creative, but whatevs. Right. Not on my watch, you don't. While that's going on, Cindy reveals she wants to see Santa so she can wish for her mom to be given a break. She acts like she's fine, but I know, it's really hard for her. So yeah, this is kind of story B, which is not a bad idea, showing the strong connection between Cindy and her mother. But you know what might have worked a little better? Showing a strong connection between Cindy and her mother? Yeah, going through this almost hour and a half long film, their time spent together before the ending is just a little over four minutes. 
All she talks about is how much she wants to help her mom, and yet she's constantly bailing on her. Never helping out and causing a ton of trouble. Come here first. I gotta go. See you guys soon. I'm gonna go find Rupert. All right, let's go. Are you going somewhere? Thanks. See you guys later. Maybe if that was the lesson, like she should have been more attentive to her mom's needs at home, but nope. The whole subplot is about her reaching Santa and nothing ever comes of it. As if that motivation wasn't weak enough, we finally get the Grinch's backstory, which why do we need? Every version says its hatred of Christmas is a mystery, but only one version actually leaves it a mystery. And God, I can't believe how often I'm pointing out the positives of this, but even in the Jim Carrey one, they do this a little better. It's stupid and unneeded, but you got why at least he hated the holiday. He was mocked, he was ridiculed, and it was done during the happiest time of the year. So it gave him a reason to hate Christmas and the Who's. It was pointless, but you at least understood his anger. Here, he's in an orphanage, and there's no other kids, no adults, and they don't celebrate Christmas? Are they Who-ish? It's not really clear how this world works, especially for a simple children's story. Even what's being shown contradicts what's being said. They'd feast on rare who roast beast, which is something the Grinch could not stand in the least. Really? Because it looks like not only can he stand it, he wants to stand it. He wants a lot of standing of that. Please, God, let him stand that. Do they mean like he can't stand it because he's not a part of it? Well, it's not what they meant in literally every other version of the story. Look, if you want to keep it vague, keep it vague. If you want to be needlessly complicated, that sucks, but at least I can follow. But you can't do something half-assed in between because it both gives us too much information and not enough information. His environment isn't well established, so his emotions aren't well established. Hell, we don't even know who looked after him, how kids treated him. We're just supposed to feel sad because he looks sad. This whole film leaves out important details and focuses on less important ones. How are we supposed to be emotionally invested when it's not even clear why they're feeling these emotions? I don't know. Why is that brown door so whimsical? It really is whimsical. Well, if you say I'm supposed to feel whimsical towards it, I'm gonna feel whimsical towards it. This is what Christmas is all about. Brown door. Brown door. Brown door. Brown door. This movie sucks. Hello, darling. Happy anniversary. I got you a present. Eggs. You love eggs, don't you? Oh, I know! I screwed up! I do this every year! I always get the wrong present! Don't I know that all you clearly want is love books? Yes, love books! Love books help customers express the sentiments that may be difficult to say out loud. It allows users to create characters that look just like themselves down to their outfits and accessories. <laughs> Isn't that creative? A dagger! Your silence is a dagger! While customers have the option to personalize each page as much as they like, their express option creates a complete book with only a few clicks. How could I not realize that they were the perfect gift for any occasion or just because? I need eggs! Friggin' eggs! What?! How did I forget that Love Books now offers a membership program as well? For you can receive a free book when you sign up, 50% off any additional books, unlimited free digital books, and discounts on gift wrap and other products. I know they're the perfect gift for any anniversary, but other occasions too. Birthdays, Valentine's Day, Christmas! Christmas is right around the corner and I got you the perfect gift! Ah! I mean, for the cost of a flower delivery or several packages of eggs, you can have a premium gift that will last for years, not just a few days. It's creative, personalized, expressive, and easy to do. Foolish me! Don't I know there is also a special offer right now with... Now, if, if you visit lovebookonline.com slash nostalgia, you receive a special 20% discount for anybody watching right now. That's 20% off just by going to lovebookonline.com slash nostalgia. Such a better gift than eggs. Will you say nothing to me at all? A dagger! A dagger in my heart! Ow. He's crazy.
She talks to toy foxes. Love book is not for yourself. It is always a gift. It is ideal for that special someone that really deserves a meaningful present. Go to lovebookonline.com slash nostalgia to receive a special 20% out discount today. What does this and Norma the North have in common? They both have snow and twerking. Genius starts with the abs, Max. Let's be honest, if it existed in 2000, it'd be in the other one. So he looks through a Christmas almanac to figure out how he'll become Santa. Christmas tree, Christmas traditions, Christmas pudding. That's funny, there's no mention of Jesus in here anywhere. The war is real, you were right, Kirk Cameron! He discovers he needs a reindeer, so he searches for one in the mountains and finds one that he calls Fred. Eh, this is a routine I've never seen in cartoons. You know, that's another problem with movies like this. They're treated like cartoons, not animated films. And yes, there is a difference. What I mean is there's a lot of fast motion and zany humor to entertain kids, but it's without any discipline for character. Like, look at how the Grinch moves. He moves like every other character. Fast, zigzaggy, big expressions. Nobody moves differently from anyone else in this. In the original, you can tell what he's like just by the way he moves. Slow, stiff, old, bitter. Max moves with a little pep in his step, but often careful like he's afraid what will happen to him. Cindy moves daintily but clumsily like a curious child would. With a fraction of the budget, you can tell their personality just by watching them. No sound, no dialogue, you know what they're like. But in a lot of animated movies now, everybody moves the same, reacts the same, expresses themselves the same, and therefore, nobody stands out. This Grinch moves like Horton, who moves like Gru, who moves like Dracula, who moved uniquely at first, but now moves like everyone else. This is because there's less care about his personality than there is about constantly making your kids laugh at silly movements, even if it doesn't match what the character is about. Want an example? Think of the Mandalorian. A brooding loner who keeps to himself. Imagine if all his movements and line deliveries were the opposite of that. I hear you are a man who keeps to himself. Yeah, that's me. Nobody can get into my tortured soul. I'm so angsty and deep. Really? Because you move like a buffoon. No, man. This is totally how brooding people move. I was just thinking about my scarring childhood. You're silly. I'm not hiring you. Wait. Can you at least get me Bill Burr's autograph? I don't like you! So Cindy meets up with her friends. You can call them pointless. And she has a plan to make her wish for her mother come true. We're gonna... Trap Santa Claus! Oh, come on, it's a Danny Elfman score! You couldn't play a little kidnap the Santa Claus at that point? They agree to help as the film certainly focuses on the how part of how the Grinch stole Christmas, as there's a lot of time spent to him stealing what he needs to steal Christmas. Feel her up! Hey, who taught Mabel how to use the doorbell? Man, that's awesome! <laughs> you smart little dog! You ever notice everybody in this movie sounds like a light imitation of their usual talent? Like, that sounds like a half-assed imitation of Kenan Thompson, doesn't it? That sounds like a half-assed imitation of Benedict Cumberbatch, doesn't it? Even the Danny Elfman score, it's like they said. Okay, we can't afford Danny Elfman, so give us an imitation. But I am Danny Elfman. And we can't afford you, so we're paying you half for an imitation. You think you can do that? I... No, I can do that. The Grinch actually grows a conscience when he sees Fred has a family and decides to let him go. First of all, how long has Fred been avoiding his family when he's had ample opportunities to escape? Fucking deadbeat dad? Second, he lets him go? What was even the point of him? And when is the Grinch nice to animals? I thought the whole thing was he treated Max like shit. One of the many reasons there's so many mean songs about him. We liked hating him. Oh, wait, my mistake. He's actually nice to Max in this one. I dare even say, treats him like a member of the family. All right, all right, I'm sorry. You're a good dog. What would you like to do? Did these two get married at some point? Look at this! In the original, it was like a punishment when he was forced to be the reindeer, but here, it's a great honor! You 
will guide my sleigh tonight. <laughs> Not my grits! Okay, so as much as they fascinatingly get wrong in this, the film does kind of get a little fun when he starts actually stealing Christmas, showcasing all these creative gadgets. They're super imaginative, and there is kind of a fun momentum around this point. But again, in the context of this world, a lot doesn't add up. Not only is his motivation for doing it still pitiful, so it's hard to get behind it, but little scenes like this happen when he comes across a sleepwalker. It's the Grinch! Shouldn't he have taken that glass? For Christ's sake, he took ice cubes from the original! How are you constantly doing the opposite?! When Cindy Lou comes across him, it doesn't make any sense either. She should recognize him. I can't believe it's really you. Uh, yeah. I mean, in the original, she's two. In the other film, she's dumb. But here they establish she's supposed to be witty and clever and such, so it doesn't match that her character would fall for this. Everyone wants presents? No, no, really, I don't. I want you to help my mom. R your mom? She needs to get laid bad. I hear there's a gigolo place down the street called Green Eggs and Ham. I should fix her right up. He, of course, still takes everything, leaving the Who's to wake up without any presents at all. Oh, Santa gave the gift of poverty. Now Mom won't have to work at all. Good job, Santa! Where's the decorations? All the presents. Once again, the Who's have to convince themselves that Christmas is worth more than just presents, which still drives me insane, as they did that in the last one too, and I just think it's more powerful if they don't notice the presents are gone. Like they're too distracted by how happy they are that it's Christmas Day. But then we couldn't leave it open to people filling in what a little bit more means. Yeah, here we have to friggin' spell that out for you. Christmas isn't here. And besides, I already have the greatest gift I could ever get. Burglary insurance. You are a close second. As you'd expect, everyone sings, the Grinch's heart grows, the presents tumble, and there really should be a sensor bar there. Fred! They wrote you a reason for being in this at the last minute! Thank God for padding! He, of course, returns the gifts to hand back to all the Who's. Uh... Hello, everybody! I stopped Santa from stealing all these. That's one kick to the sleigh bells he won't forget. He admits to his wrongdoing and walks back home after returning the gifts. Knock, knock, Max. I need to be alone. I estimate I have 20 minutes before they rally a mob to burn me. But Cindy comes knocking on his door later that night. My name is Cindy Lou. Cindy Lou who? I heard you steal things. I was kind of hoping you could take my brothers. She invites him to their house for Christmas dinner, and I'm not gonna lie, this is the closest thing they added in the movie that legitimately works. He awkwardly tries to blend in, not always doing a good job, but people still welcome him with open arms. It's different, takes its time, and is nicely handled. Kind of like a planes, trains, and automobiles ending, if you will. Merry Christmas, Mr. Grinch. Merry Christmas, Cindy Lou. So what kind of meat is this? Reindeer? FRED! Quiet dignity and grace. So that was the second theatrical Grinch movie. I think this face sums it up. Yeah. It's fascinating the things it gets wrong. Stuff you'd think would be the easiest to set up. Everybody's motivations, actions, even how they move are off. The live action one is bad, but at least I got why the Grinch hated Christmas, why Cindy Lou loved Christmas, and a distinct character from everyone. Even if they were all unlikable as fuck. So, is it worse than the live action one? It's kinda pick your poison. The motivations are set up in the live action one, and it certainly stands out, even if it is as a fear and loathing in Las Vegas Christmas. But I'll admit, I do like the way this film looks, with its winter lighting, gentle colors, and certainly more Christmas atmosphere than this sewage-stained Universal Studios attraction. I also do like the ingenuity when he's stealing Christmas, and that legit nice couple of minutes at the end. So I guess I like this a little better, but it depends on what you find more interesting. A safe, bland mess you'll probably forget quickly about? Or an insane catastrophe that has to be seen to be believed? 
you guys can duke it out which one is better and which one is worse. I'm gonna keep watching the smaller, simpler story that maybe, perhaps, means a little bit more. I'm a nostalgia critic, I remember, so you don't have to! Can you at least keep your legs closed? WHY ARE YOU STILL HERE?! Quiet dignity and grace. Hey, Doug Walker here doing the charity shout out and uh, every year we do Toys for Tots, uh, that's this week. And uh, we do it not only because it's a great charity, but uh, there's a really funny story that happened when we were shooting uh, one of our episodes, the Christmas with the Cranks episode. Uh, and it just makes me laugh and it does tie into Toys uh, for Tots, so uh, I'm just going to play that clip as well as the charity shout out from that. Uh, everything still says stands, it's a great charity and it's a funny story, so check it out. I have a funny story for you. Uh, when we were shooting this review, we were outside about to shoot a scene with uh, Nostalgia Critic and Santa Christ, and this car pulls up, and they pull right into our parking spot, and we don't recognize the people, and they get out, and we say, can we help you? And they say, uh, Toys for Tots. I drop it off Toys for Tots. Oh. No, 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 we're not Toys for Tots. And they're looking at us like, are you sure? And we said, yeah, we're sure. Why would we know where Toys for Tots are? And they said, well, because you got a guy dressed like Santa Claus there. Oh, no. <laughs> Un unrelated. Amazing. Totally unrelated. So, bizarrely enough, they were driving around looking for Toys for Tots, and we happened to come outside with a guy dressed as Santa Claus. What are the chances? <laughs> And I took it as a sign. So the charity we are doing this week is Toys for Tots. Uh, a lot of you have heard this charity before. This is a charity that gets toys to kids who are not able to have toys this Christmas. A lot of people donate in December, but for next year, it's good to know that they actually start in October and November as well. Uh, the more toys they can get, the more kids can have these toys. And these are children that either come across hard times or the parents come across hard times and are unable to get gifts. I mean, there are so many people out there that are just going through such rough patches right now and just are not able to do something that every kid deserves. Every kid deserves to have presents around Christmas time. And these are people that make it happen. It's of course done by the Marine Corps, but they also have so many good sponsors behind it. They have Disney, they have Macy's, they have Toys R Us. All these people try so hard to raise awareness and you see that poster everywhere of Santa with the marine uniform in the closet and if you even go to their YouTube channel Marine Toys for Tots you'll see that so many kids benefit from this and so many celebrities get behind this as well and it's just a good cause because every little kid deserves presents on Christmas and by donating toys or money to this wonderful charity you can help make that happen. So whether it's donating online or just driving around until you see a guy dressed like Santa, please definitely take the time to look into it, buy a gift for a child less fortunate, and help them have a wonderful holiday. Donate to Toys for Tots. Yes! It's awesome. a good organization. Santa Christ approves. 